Hello, everybody. When we last met, I promised we would hop from house to house, looking at select sets of various battle armor. While researching, I was reminded of an armor designed by the Lyran Commonwealth, which has enough variants and a unique history, so it's going to get its own video. While I know not everyone is a big fan of quad battle armor designs, I think the Fenrir is a good option to try in your next game of Tabletop Battletech. In order to really wrap our brains around this Assault class battle armor, we need to head back to the earliest days of Inner Sphere battle armor design. Though generally assumed to be a more modern form of battle armor, the quad-legged armor first appears at almost the same time as the bipedal version. As we've discussed before, the arrival of the clans in the Inner Sphere kick-started significant investments in a wide range of defense research projects. This included battle armor designs. While the most popular and well-known versions of those are bipedal and humanoid in shape, the Inner Sphere also flirted with a walking platform type battlesuit that would be strong enough and stable enough for a mech scaled weaponry. One of those projects was the SLHX program within the Lyran Commonwealth. Eventually known as the Sloth, this first attempt at a heavy battle armor design looked more like an amateurish attempt to replace the wheels and treads on a tank uh, with legs. Because why not? The program was advanced to completion with the aid of technical data obtained by the Somerset Strikers in a raid on the Jade Falcon research facility on Twycross. The sloth was pushed into production, armed with only two small lasers and a mine launching device designed specifically to destroy battle mechs. It would actually waddle underneath a mech and then launch the mine up and to attach to the, the battle mech. Go ahead and watch the cartoon if you don't believe me. The Sloth was an unusual sight on the battlefield, and its quirks were many. When it went into full production in 3050, hopes were high that it would provide an edge to the Lyrans in their fight against the Jade Falcons. Unfortunately, many soldiers and their battlefield commanders were just put off by the lackluster performance of the Sloth and its just unusual use on the battlefield. So it gradually filtered out of both use and production. Curiously, the Sloth did receive an upgrade in the 3080s, which replaced the mine launcher with an ECM suite and an ER version of the small lasers. Production was limited, and the Sloth was only ever seen amongst the Lyran Commonwealth Armed Forces and occasionally with the Federated Sons. Following the Sloth's lackluster career, it was obvious that another solution for heavy weapons carrying battle armor would be needed. That solution would end up being the Fenrir. When Archon Catherine Steiner Davion rose to power in 3057, she ordered the development and production of a heavy battle armor design that would not only be battlefield effective, but also stand as a symbol of strength in the face of a fractured Federated Commonwealth. Designers dug through their existing research and worked to build an armored unit that could keep the stability and strength of the sloth, but vastly improve almost every other aspect of it, with the latest technology and understanding of the physics of battle armor. Design and prototyping of the new battle armor designated the Fenrir after the demon wolf of ancient Northern European mythology began in 3058 and would see full production in January of 3060. Designated a highly mobile weapons platform rather than a standard battle armor, the Fenrir has a mass of 2000 kilograms and is incredibly fast for its assault weight class, running at up to 43.2 kilometers per hour. This far outpaces almost all the other battle armor designs and approaches the running speed of some assault mechs. There are no jump jets, but this is one of those cases where the benefits outweigh the cost. The 250 kilograms of standard armor is not excellent in comparison to most battle armor, but it can stop some light arms fire for a short amount of time. Most of the armor is concentrated around the pilot, who sits in a very cramped space that could be described as a cockpit, if you're being very generous, though I should mention that the Fenrir really shouldn't be confused with a protomech though there is a tendency to see kind of a blurred line there, especially with the quad battle armor designs. While sitting in the Fenrir, the pilot has a 300 degree rotations with its weapon systems, which are found entirely within a turret mount on the armor's back. On the turret, there is a wide variety of weapon systems that can be installed, so let's dig into them. For firing against armor and battle mechs, the Fenrir can be equipped with a medium pulse laser that's a full size one, an SRM-4 with four shots, or an ER medium laser, it's also full size. It's interesting to note that during the design phase, the possibility of mounting the full-size medium pulse laser on the armor reached the ear of the Archon. She was so excited by the possibility that she insisted that the engineers make it happen. Sure enough, after some long evenings in the labs, they got it to work. 
In its fire support configuration, the Fenrir can carry a heavy mortar, which can fire up to 900 meters, and a machine gun for protection should the enemy close in within the mortar's minimum range. For anti-infantry or anti-battle armor roles, the Fenrir can choose from the following. Three machine guns, three small lasers, or two small pulse lasers. While the Sloth was met with hesitation and derision, the Fenrir was welcomed with open arms by soldiers and battlefield commanders who felt empowered to finally bring a considerable amount of firepower to play against their enemies. Very quickly, the Fenrir earned its reputation as a flexible and speedy threat that could not be ignored. During the Solaris riots in 3064, the Fenrir was used very successfully by Sergeant Major Henry Wimbledon in ambush attacks against light vehicles and battle mechs. During the assault on Hesperus II during the Word of Blake kerfuffle, Lieutenant Ophelia Hathaway led her unit of Fenrirs armed with pulse lasers and Inferno SRMs in a doomed delaying action. Fighting in very close quarters and from factory hallways, access tunnels, and bunkers, Hathaway and her unit racked up dozens of Blakist armor kills. Eventually, ammunition and overwhelming numbers resulted in Hathaway's unit being wiped out. It stands as a testament to the strength of the Fenrir that it held up under the withering fire of Blakist aggression. In 3076, Tharhees Industries decided to give the popular Fenrir battle armor an upgrade on the production line on Tharkad. The goal was to provide a long-range weapons loadout option that could also address the lack of armor which had been the Fenrir's Achilles heel since its inception. It also added a battle armor scale C3 computer system so it could join the network and improve the performance of an entire force. On the turret, two clan LRM-5s were added with two shots each. The overall armor was increased to 350 kilograms, which is a 40% increase over the original Fenrir. The clan LRMs allowed the suit to fire across the battlefield as well as a point blank if necessary. Designated the long shot version of the Fenrir, the suit was never in heavy production since obtaining clan LRM launchers at the time was difficult and the C3 gear expensive. While the 7 plus 1 armor is a welcomed improvement, the limitation of ammo on those LRM-5s to just two shots makes it much more likely that this version of the Fenrir would be quite rare. It's a specialized variant, and those tend not to do very well in the constantly shifting battlefield environments of the 31st and 32nd centuries. Now you might be thinking, Mechfrog, that's great and all, but what about the later eras? Of course you aren't thinking that, because this is just a rhetorical trick to transition to the next topic. Good for you for spotting it. I have the smartest subscribers on YouTube. Except for that everyday engineering guy. Wow, they are they are smart. Where was I? Uh, the lingering complaints concerning the lack of armor on the Fenrir finally led to action. A quarter of a century after first being fielded, the Fenrir was showing its age. Pilots had started referring to the battle armor as the TTV, or Ticket to Valhalla, due to the swift death they would face if they ever got hit with anything more than glancing fire. The attempt to address issues as well as take advantage of new technologies resulted in the Fenrir II. Never being ones to go overboard, the Lyrans boosted the armor to a whopping 680 kilograms, which is a 17 plus 1 for those playing the home game. That's a little bit more than three times as much armor as the original. This did come at the cost of mobility, dropping the Fenrir's speed to just 32.4 kilometers per hour. While this is still fast for battle armor, it does hurt a little bit losing that fourth movement point. The modular turret system was preserved but the possible weapons loadouts are vastly improved. Options include two medium recoilless rifles, a clan LRM-4 with 10 shots, a clan SRM-5 with six shots, a mech scale medium laser, or two bear hunter super heavy auto cannons with 20 shots each along with two machine guns. Just as with the original Fenrir, you have a wide variety of options and would likely see a mixture in any unit of Fenrir 2s in the field. The prospect of being targeted by four SRM-5s from a concealed position would be absolutely terrifying. During the 19th Battle of Hesperus II, the Fenrir IIs were deployed to fight a running defense through the urban environment and mountainous terrain against the zealous Jade Falcons. Imagine the look on the faces of the people of Hesperus II after the 19th invasion. Oh boy. Anyway, using concealed positions, ambushes, and natural choke points, the Lyran forces whittled down the clan invaders. At Mardston Tuttle, the defiant planetary militia held out against a trinary of falcons from the raptor Keshek. Tanks were used to block the mountain pass, while battle-armored infantry led by Hopman Wagner used the surrounding rocky terrain to fire down onto the Jade Falcons. Clan forces walking into an obvious trap? Who could have predicted that outcome, right? 
As the weather deteriorated and the Falcon advance slowed through the mountain pass, Fenrir II's and other battle armor took pot shots from concealed positions from the top of the ridgeline overlooking the highway. The Falcon Forces Max took considerable damage while only a few Lyrans were killed in return. Battle mechs that tried to jump onto the ridge to chase down the ambushers were met with concentrated fire. Though the Falcons were significantly delayed at the pass, it did come at the cost of 37% of Wagner's battle armored troops. It remains an unfortunate reality of warfare that no matter how much technology is adopted, the lowly foot soldier is still ultimately tasked with the brunt of the costs of war. The Fenrir IIs are excellent upgrades to an already powerful battle armor system. They're not going to be found across the inner sphere due to the difficulty in procuring clan weaponry, but who knows what the future holds with clans like Sea Fox, the Ghost Bears, and Snow Raven increasingly incorporated into the cultures of the inner sphere. It's possible that the success of the Fenrir II could result in increased production with alternative loadouts that filter outside of Lyran military units. Now, while I don't know how many other battle armor designs are going to get their own video, the Fenrir II was just too cool and had such an interesting history that I couldn't resist getting into it a little bit deeper. I hope you agree. Thanks for watching. If you hit the like and subscribe buttons, it lets the almighty YouTube algorithm know that it should show the videos to others. Going a step further by becoming a channel member provides a link to our Discord where we hang out, share Battletech photos, stories, and painted mechs. It also helps make sure I can keep making videos for the channel at the brisk pace to which we've become accustomed. Big thanks to everyone who's already taken that leap to directly support this channel's nonsense. Now take care, and until we meet again, go out and make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.